here to talk about our collective efforts with SEAC and EERI. Uh, let me make sure I have the, the answer here. Uh, I'm Ryan Kirsten, practicing structural engineer here in Sacramento with a company called Bueller. Uh, I'm a volunteer with the Structural Engineers Association. Uh, I do this as my uh, fun free time. Um, but I'd also, being from Sacramento, I'd like to welcome you to Sacramento. I hope you enjoy your stay here in my beautiful hometown. Happy to see a lot of familiar faces in the room, but also happy to see some new faces that we're looking forward to collaborating with in the conversations today. So by way of introduction and just a kind of quick where are we going in our presentation, I'll spend a few minutes giving you an introduction and background, and then I'll hand it off to David to get into some, to some additional detail on our thoughts on functional recovery. Uh, the background to SEAC and EERI. SEAC has over 3,500 members uh, spanning the structural engineering industry. We're committed to improving the safety and the resilience of our built environment through state-of-the-art engineering practice, uh, through our code and standards advisory work, something Chris mentioned earlier on, uh, we've been doing for a number of years, and through our public policy advocacy, which we are a little younger at, uh, but we found has been an important effort to be visible and to be trusted technical advisors in the public policy arena. Uh, many of these activities are guided by the SEAC Board of Directors position statement recently on supporting the evolution of codes to do better than just life safety. Uh, the goal there is to provide something in terms of recovery time and being a little bit more explicit about that. We know that the code provides some of that performance, but we're not talking about it. And we want to do that in a public environment with uh, better transparency. EERI. Uh, is a multidisciplinary nonprofit technical society. You can see here their members have a breadth of experience and expertise, not just from the design professionals with engineers and architects, but also with emergency planners, managers, uh, risk analysts, government officials, and social scientists. And for the perspectives and uh, the conversations we're having now about functional recovery and community resilience, those perspectives of those additional experts beyond just the design professionals is critical to make sure we're understanding the different factors and parameters. EERI's mission, if I could be uh, allowed to summarize it for them, uh, is to reduce earthquake risk by advancing the science, uh, improving the understanding of the impact of earthquakes, and advocating for comprehensive and realistic measures for reducing those effects. Uh, they have a number of white papers and policy statements that really are leading, I would say, in the industry. Uh, and David will be spending some time to talk about one of those in particular in more detail. Some of this has been covered already, uh, so I'll just highlight a few of the key things about what SEAC and ERI have been doing for years already on current code provisions to maintain and provide life safety. Uh, you've heard about how uh, the code is addressing that already. Uh, I did want to highlight uh, some of the efforts at the federal level through the FEMA programs on the P58 process, the next generation performance based design. These are the tools that weren't available 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. Uh, and the concept or the opportunity to provide and quantify performance in terms of safety, repair cost, and repair time. That, that tool and that te techniques are available now, and that really has opened the door for a lot of conversations when we talk about how do our codes and standards evolve from a safety basis to something that consider these time aspects that were once uh, not being able to be explicitly covered. Our motivation to be involved uh, is in response to the interest from elected officials and the public in general. It aligns with our organizational mission and vision statements and the activities we've been traditionally involved with. Uh, we're keen on the interest not being just about life safety, but about being maintaining our livelihood. Um, we realize it's not just an engineering issue. Uh, at SEAC in particular, we know that this is going to span uh, perspectives and expertise that is maybe beyond uh, what we have specific within our SEAC community. And that's why SEAC and EURI have been entered into an MOU to partner together to collaborate as much as possible uh, to leverage and engage our collective expertise across the entire spectrum uh, to address uh, these new and upcoming topics. Uh, in terms of some of the specific activities you heard the assembly member talking about California Assembly Bill 393, that's something that more recently SEAC has been taking the lead on with EERI support. Uh, and then the NEHR pre-authorization, EERI was very influential in getting certain language in there that led to the Committee of Experts and some of those charges to our friends in FEMA and NIST. Uh, and we've been collaborating with them on that as well. The programs really are complementary. We know that in the past there was some confusion uh, a year or two ago about what the feds were doing and what California could be doing. 
Uh, this way is now set up to be quite complementary with the NEHRP reports being ready uh, in early or mid-2020, which would be in time for the committee or the working group that could be arranged by AB 393 to pick up the ball from there and look about how we can apply that effort or those options that get uh, discussed to the situation here in California. And then just again, highlighting some, some things that maybe have been already mentioned but are worth repeating. Some of our additional observations on functional recovery. We know there's the working definition. We know the FEMA and this group is gonna be working on coming up with a little bit more of a consensus definition on that. Uh, we know that there's some confusion with the original version of 1857 talking about immediate occupancy. We know that 393 is specifically more about functional recovery. There is a difference between those two. We know that recovery time will vary by occupancy. It's not immediate occupancy for all uh, occupancy types. Uh, and we know that some systems may not need much change from the current code provisions. Once we start to quantify performance of the codes providing, we may realize that certain of these occupancies may have design provisions that are adequate right now, and others we may want to consider uh, rearranging. So we'll be considering all that, we'll be considering what sort of tools and techniques are within the current code framework. Uh, we'll also be looking outside of the box and being creative as we respond to what we're considering a call to action from the public and from our elected officials. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to David. Thanks, Ryan. So uh, I'm going to spend a little time talking about the CDRI paper that Ryan mentioned. Uh, the title of this uh, few slides is interesting, and I think it's uh, going to echo a lot of things you've heard already this morning from Chris and from uh, Mike and Steve from NIST and FEMA, and even from uh, pretty much everybody has uh, made this relationship. I'm going to try to show you why the idea of why we need a functional recovery standard is kind of an inescapable conclusion if you're thinking about community resilience. So, two organizations, uh, uh, ERI and SEOP, Ryan and I are representing. I'm also going to mention briefly a paper that's already been mentioned by SK and by Mike for the NEHRP uh, Provisions Update Committee. I've talked about those just very briefly. The ERI paper is called a conceptual framework, and ERI is also working on developing some policy positions. Uh, those will be coming later. The conceptual framework is due to be posted next week, so that whole paper will be available to you. The PUC white paper has been mentioned, has been through balloting, it's now in the common resolution phase, uh, but it'll be available, I think, pretty soon uh, uh, as well. And uh, I'll mention that again briefly at the end, but mostly I'm talking here about the ERI conceptual framework, which is just uh, published uh, in the last few days. Uh, it does three basic th things. Gives you a, gives us a starting point for what we're talking about. It's going to describe the state of practice and talk about where we go from there. So the starting point, again, goes back to, after waiting again for Mike and Steve, the New York reauthorization. There's a new purpose written into the New York reauthorization for community resilience. That's new. It hasn't been in federal regulations before. What is community resilience? Well, you may have seen some of these diagrams. Everybody has one, including me. And the reason they're all there is because we're all struggling with how to do it, and there's nothing consensus about it. Also, what's interesting is that when you're talking about community resilience, you're not just talking about engineers. So we have to recognize that resilience as a concept came from the field of psychology and from environmental regulations. And from anything unrelated to structural engineering, you can think of everybody who wants to talk about resilience. That's why we have all these things we have to maybe see if we can reconcile or find a way to fit in what we do with earthquakes and with structural engineering into this model. Not new, for the last 10 years, organizations, most of these are federal agencies have been developing concepts and definitions of resilience, and you can look at those and then go back again 10 years, cribbing from each other, making tweaks here and there, small changes to the language, but you can divine from these, if you look at them closely, four, I think, common themes from this about how, what we might define. The first one is that we're talking about natural hazards. Now you may get a little bit of pushback on that from the folks at Rockefeller, but at least for us today, we're talking about earthquakes and uh, functional recovery with regard to earthquakes, so we're talking about a natural hazard effect. The second one is that it's primarily about recovery, not about safety. You've heard that word many times already. Something Chris pointed out is that it's, it's a deeply associated with reco recovery time and that the idea of just-in-time is a new concept being built in, so it doesn't have to be immediate, like immediate occupancy. There's a range of things that we can begin to just think about the current, what SK talked about, our current codes. They're, they may be quite good right now if we can just start to talk about them in, in terms of time. And the last one, as Chris mentioned, is that resilience, when we think about it, is really not an attribute of physical buildings or physical pipes at all. It's an attribute of the human organizations. 
It's important to keep in mind. So that's part of our starting point. NIST now talking about community resilience, and then is charged with doing research to improve community resilience through building codes and standards. So now you're just thinking, wait a minute, didn't he just say that resilience is not about buildings? That's right, it's about uh, building codes and standards. It's not clear how they're gonna relate to resilience, but we can do it with a chart like this that comes from the Meister Consultants Group. So on the vertical axis, it, run, axis, it runs from the top, it's called technical, I hope you can see it from where you're sitting. Technical stuff is about the physical building, the structure, the non-structure, maybe the contents. At the bottom, holistic. That's what I just described before about resilience when we think about it as being about human organizations, it's about the uses, the occupancies, the people, the things that we're really trying to do with the built environment. So that's holistic. And on the, the uh, uh, horizontal axis, it runs all the way from when you're dealing with an individual facility to when you're dealing with the whole community. So we have this grid, and we can plot any of the ideas that any of you have brought today. Somewhere on this grid, if they're talking about resilience, it's a very useful way of pointing out that even if it sounds like we're sometimes talking about disparate things, we are on the same page, we are in the resilience field together, and the question is how to relate them to each other. So when we talk about community resilience as being a holistic thing about the community, the way the Rockefeller Foundation talks about it, they're down in this bottom right-hand corner. It's very holistic, it's very community scale. Something that Chris talked about in this community resilience planning guide begins to take that and kind of solidify it, turn it into plans, start to break the community into sectors of different services being provided. That, I think, probably falls somewhere in the middle of this diagram. But when we talk about building codes, we are talking about something that's very technical and is applied one building at a time, so clearly that's the kind of thing that shows up in the top left. So that doesn't mean they're completely disparate. The challenge to us is to do both of these things. When we write the building code, make sure we have in mind the overall goal, which is holistic and community-wide. And then when we talk about community resilience as holistic and community-wide, to understand that what we eventually have to produce is a functional recovery standard, which is gonna be applied in a very technical way to one building at a time. So just as long as we keep these ideas in mind, we can relate the different ideas to each other. So, still back to the starting point from where ERI is coming from. So we know that the NIST and FEMA the, the New York reoccupization says now we're going to look for options to talk about reoccupancy and functional recovery. So finally we see that word functional recovery, but it is building from the concept of community resilience. The second starting point, Assembly Bill Zerian talked about, Assembly Bill 393, not all earthquake bills are great, but this one is. It's very important that 393 we should be behind it. It is putting California on a path to have a functional recovery standard. The definition that we see for this workshop actually is in that bill, or very, very similar to it, and it was actually written by SEAC and ERI, so we're kind of proud of that. Here's that definition. It's in the handouts for today, and of course, one of the key ideas there is, what, is it, what do we mean by basic intended functions? Of course, we can parse this whole definition for all kinds of things. There's lots of questions we can ask. I hope we're gonna start to ask some of those this afternoon. So that's our starting point. The second thing the ERI paper does it says, kind of summarizes, what is the state of practice? And not just the state of practice for buildings, but also because of the New York reauthorization, the state of practice for life on infrastructure systems too. And not just for new buildings, but for new buildings and existing, because we know those things are there. So we respect what we're trying to do today, focus on buildings, focus on new buildings, focus on functional recovery. Yet we understand that there's a larger picture in the ERI uh, paper uh, embraces that larger picture based on the New York reauthorization scope. The key point to take away from this, I think, is understanding that the buildings and the infrastructure work together. Chris got to this point that they are, everybody else did too. Everybody recognizes that they're inter interrelated and interdependent. What we are talking about here is a system of systems. That's a challenge. And we also know that we are dealing with existing material that's been in the ground for 50 years. So we know that's not gonna change overnight. The point I think the ERA paper tries to make one of them is that we have to embrace that. We have to acknowledge that there's a whole community of people who design pipelines and who design uh, you know, airports and transit systems and who design buildings and we work in different silos and that's okay. We're gonna have to be comfortable with that and recognize that uh, we're not gonna go, but if we wait for us all to say, well, we have to create a complete blank slate and start over, that's just a non-starter. It's just not gonna happen. So we have to understand that, embrace it, work with it, be in coordination with each other, have, as Chris called for, a consistent set of definitions and terminology so that we can be in coordination with each other. 
The last thing the year I paper does, and really the most important part, is uh, uh, to talk about this concept development, how, where it goes from there. When we were thinking about it, we identified four areas, four issue areas, where we know the conversations are going to happen in hopefully these areas or maybe more. And we know that they're related to each other, for sure. And uh, in fact, we know that the definitional stuff is going to feed into everything else. The PUC paper takes the perspective of the building code developers, and everybody here who's a building code uh, code official understands a point that Mike Pfeiffer made, that when we deal in the technical issue area, and we're asking what does functional recovery mean, how do we measure it, how do we define it, how do we uh, uh, design for it, what are the strategies we would use to achieve it, that's the kind of thing that goes into a technical standard. The policy, what is the acceptable recovery time? What kind of functional recovery do we really need from buildings of a certain use or occupancy? How much is good enough? What are we willing to pay for? That's a policy question, and eventually it gets codified into a code of code. So that's the code and standard model. When Pfeiffer mentioned it, and I think we'll probably be talking about it this afternoon as well. But there are four, the, those four issue areas are important, and this is the last key point that I think the ERI paper wants to make. Each of these issue areas is going to progress independently, we know that. And I can tell you my own experience from the last 10 years talking about this stuff is it is the easiest thing in the world to say, well, we can't solve the technical issue until we know what the policy is going to do. And we can't do the policy issue if we haven't thought about governmental authority and we haven't figured out what the costs and benefits are. And by the way, do we even define, we even define what it is we're talking about? So we know that that's going to happen. That's a challenge. We have to resist the temptation to not make progress. The temptation is to say, wait until all the ducks are in a row, and then we'll sort it out. The ERI paper makes, I think, its strongest statement it says we need to identify and embrace this, this uh, reality that these things are going to progress independently and not wait for gaps in some other field before we start making our own progress. If everyone takes a step ahead in these different fields, it's okay. They can progress independently, and everyone eventually is going to catch up. 